Hi guys, welcome back to Snakes and Adders Reptile Advice. This is a like a follow-up video to a, a comment that was left on the video we did about brumation and enforced brumation uh, regardless of breeding by in our primary intent. And this comment challenges maybe some of those those things that we were talking about. Um, and it, it's really uh, got me thinking. Full disclosure, this is the third attempt to try to make this video. And it's good because you need stuff to, to challenge you or stop you in your tracks. So I was like reading this and I thought, yeah, shit, hold my beer, I got this. And then it's like, mm, yeah, it's a tricky one. So let me read it and then I've tried to have a think about it. No doubt people are going to jump in with their two penneth. It's interesting. Is it worth consideration that snakes in captivity tend to live longer though? I'm quite sure even with predation accounted for, this is mostly true of most species. Is brumation in captivity more about quality of life than quantity of time an animal is alive perhaps? I just have to wonder. We remove predation as a factor when we choose to keep animals like snakes and we feed them with regularity, the likes of which the species would never experience in the wild. Is this really worse than the wild just because it's unnatural? I'm just rambling, I don't have the answers. I feel like it's a discussion keepers don't have often. Is it entirely unfeasible that brumation isn't necessarily healthier for many species just because it's part of the wild condition? Because I think at least with some things it stands to reason that natural isn't always better. Tasty that one. Got plenty of meat on the bone with that question. And that is from uh, Jackal26 on YouTube. Thank you for the question. It's tied me in knots I'm trying to think of a way to approach it from the way you've worded it you don't necessarily believe this it's just you do what I do which is play devil's advocate and you you, you try and bat for the other team and you want to pressure test a theory um, when it comes to brumation or such like so in the rumination about brumation video yeah the principle was is it beneficial to brumate animals that potentially are from the northern climes of temperate regions Russian rat snakes, uh, Aesculapian rat snakes, black rat snakes, uh, common garters, prairie kings, western hognose, such like such. So, and and you know from from a longevity perspective and, and everything else. So, uh, Jackal Twenty Six made a comment about uh, the wild condition, and I suppose if if um, the Brumation is part of the, the wild condition, then predation is part of the wilder condition, parasitic burden, both internal and external, uh, sporadic prey availability. Um, yet, with all of these factors and all of these stresses in action uh, dynamically on an animal in the wild, they manage to maintain a level of balance, which we call homeostasis. So if we can establish what a wild condition is, we need to look at what a captive condition is. And that would obviously be the removal of predation, the removal of parasitic burdens, um, regular play, prey availability, and optional brum brumation. So we, we have these as a set of factors. I think maybe what Jackal didn't take into account was if we remove one issue, we potentially create another and in this case potentially what we've done is remove parasitic burdens which would feast upon some of the prey that the animals eat themselves in the gut and they would take their own parts of the goodness and the snakes therefore would need a greater level of, of, of food intake to maintain or gain weight commensurate to a captive comparison animal and then we're obviously, with it being a captive animal and the fact that humans are just programmed to be feeders, feeding our animals with a greater level of regularity, meaning that fat stores and body stores are increased, which means that growth is exponential and therefore faster than it would be naturally. And also, inevitably, the storage of lipids around the body will be increased as well. So we've removed parasites, we've removed sporadic prey availability, and we've given them too much food and there's no parasites to take any of that burden and therefore uh, we create fat snakes. Uh, obesity is human caused. Uh, it is um, 
people anthropomorphizing their animals, you know, oh, he looks hungry, I'll give him some. And I think the problem that we've got is that we, if we're not careful, just because they're in captivity, we lose sight of what a healthy animal would be. What proof is there that the wild animals don't live uh, as long as captive animals? Because the way that some people bre uh, feed their animals, some of the big breeders as well, biggest breeders, will show you videos of chronically obese animals that have got such excessive fat stores, they look nothing like the species they're supposed to be. So like retics that look like Burmese, because they're so bloated and distended. If you think about, you know, humans, uh, the action of humans on earth, the record site setting stuff like the, the giant retics in floors, I think it was about 1926, 1927. And, you know, you think about in the wild condition, with predation, with parasitic burdens, with sporadic prey availability, this animal still potentially managed to exceed 20 feet in length. How old do you suppose that animal would be? Certainly more than four or five. We know that commonplace we can get a retic to 16 feet without breaking sweat for a mainland and maybe even start to approach 18 feet over maybe six or seven years. But then it really starts to slow off. And what the problem is, is that people continue to feed them because they're desperate to have a giant. And actually they just ended up with one of these bloated fat worms that we see that looks more like a Burmese than a retic. And it takes years and years and years for the animals to finally achieve that size. So animals in excess of 20 feet invariably are going to be at least a decade or more old, potentially even uh, approaching uh, 20, you know. And it's, it's that, that that we've got to bear in mind. When we strip away and we think that we're doing the right thing by we've removed all these parasites, we're trying to remove anything that could act as a stressor upon our animal, we're trying to maintain uh, environmental control, we're trying to do these other things. We want to feed them, we want them to be healthy, but it's ever so easy on one of nature's most efficient animals to go too far and provide too much nourishment because it's easy to get it on a snake. It's a nightmare to get it off. So surely it would be better to err to the side of caution and just take it easy with food intake. That would make so much more sense. Um, the brumation process is to allow us to feed with regularity throughout the year and then use nature to help us put an animal through a naturalistic or pseudo naturalistic you know after all we are, we're putting them through an artificial brumation and and um we're going to put them through this naturalistic behavior we're going to allow them to use fat stores that they have uh, attained throughout the year and then come spring they want to feed again now bearing in mind that a lot of these animals particularly the males are going to go off their food so they're giving you um natural cues to follow now we can choose to ignore it and become stressed because our animal isn't feeding every week anymore when in the wild it wouldn't do now whilst nature may like you're saying potentially nature is nature better I, or is, is it, it the natural way isn't better well that's a difficult one a lot of the people up at the top end of the hobby they're wanting to push forward this um the advancement of, of nature and making sure naturalistics why it's why bioactive and and other naturalistic enclosure types have got such a uh, a firm uh, hold on the hobby and and they're definitely a growth market and it's because people are beginning to agree that following natural cues is beneficial to the animals from maybe cognitive and other ways ways of uh, improving the life I mean realistically I, I kind of come at it at a slightly different angle which is more about mechanics so take a hide you go snake hunting you're not going to find a snake under a log you're going to find it under an old tire or a piece of plywood or so you know it, a hide serves a function which is to take it out of line of sight of the person who's looking into the tank. What that hide looks like, the snake does not care as long as it's a hide. We care. 
So as much as people row about how oh, naturalistic is best, are there mechanical purposes that are being served by elements within the vivarium? Absolutely. Could you use um, PVC uh, plumbing and tubing to create logs and branches or the effect of logs and branches? Absolutely. Could you use plastic boxes instead of hides that they can hide in that are opaque? Absolutely. They serve a mechanical purpose. Do they look attractive? No, but that was never the primary driver. The primary driver was mechanically, does it work? And it's these sorts of things that we need to look at. Mechanically, brumation has a purpose for animals from temperate zones. When we think about animals from within the tropics or equatorial regions, it's less of a problem. But what we have as an issue that replaces that is a much slower metabolism. And people will feed their boas and their larger pythons like they are some mega fast metabolism, the American water snake or rat snake, who, I mean, you feed them and they shit out within two or three days. Whereas, you know, some of these snakes, like, like the bigger blood pythons and stuff, you might only need to feed them every six weeks on a really good sized meal, but then just leave them. They don't need any more than that. It's not natural for them to feed more than that. If we create an artificial level of growth, that isn't us improving their life. That's us putting their, their renal system, their heart, everything else under pressure. And if we put it under excess amounts of pressure, then things can go wrong. If we allow too many fats to build up around the renal system, this becomes a breeding ground for cancers and tumours and all this sort of stuff. So absolutely, as, as keepers, do we have a responsibility to ensure the longevity of an animal as well as quality of life? Well, absolutely. And you don't want them to, you know, you don't want to spoil them and then kill them within four years. When if you'd allowed them to take their time and grow at a natural rate, you get the 25, 30 years out of them. And the only person you can look at to critique yourself if it happens is yourself because you're the one that's fed it. And, 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 and feeding is just one element of it. Then there's the, the brumation, then there's the UV light, then there's the heat, then there's your handling, then there's positioning within the home. There's a whole bunch of different stresses that you can apply or look at. And these variables and the minutiae of, of reptiles, well, we're, we're talking about snakes, but any reptiles care, you then need to look at to be able to analyze whether you're incrementally improving or making an animal's life worse. Um, you know, the, the, I think as well, when it comes to brumation, traditionally, certainly for me, it was more a case of was breeding a primary driver. If it wasn't a primary driver, feed them for as long as they want to feed. If they go off food, then you, then you brumate them. Nowadays, with the more I know, then potentially I'd be more inclined, certainly with the northern stuff, the Chinese beauties, the, the Russian rats and more rats, that sort of stuff, they, they, they're they going to get brumated simply because otherwise they, they end up fat. Um, but, you know, is this something that novices necessarily need to worry about? No, I, I don't necessarily think so. I think maybe we just need to be careful about food intake not going too mad, trying to get things too big too soon. You see, there has to be an access point. Every one of these people that argues the toss about the advancement and husbandry and everything else will inevitably have joined this hobby as children whose mum and dad bought them their first pet who particularly weren't into this hobby and then through the passion and drive and everything else that I've got that you've got that they that, you know that they've developed themselves they've read and they've learned and they've they've adapted and they've 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 raised their game and and developed so what we can't do is once we've climbed the ladder, we can't pull the ladder up and say everybody else down on the ground, you're not allowed to come up. That's not the way it works. There's always going to be kids. They're the next generation. We lead them with a carrot. We don't whip them with a stick. We don't necessarily make it hard for them. We need to have an access route and then it needs to be an aspirational climb to husbandry excellence. You don't just come straight out of the box fully formed perfect keeper i mean who's perfect after all anyway <coughs> striking that balance between what we perceive to be aesthetically pleasing and then what is mechanically correct are two very separate things and you can achieve mechanically correct in aesthetically terrible enclosures but the mechanics are what count the aesthetics for me take a back seat over 
the mechanical uh, action of a viv can they hide can they drink can they do this, this that the other for the people that put aesthetics first that can ride roughshod over the needs or wants of your animal um, if you take a royal python for example will it hide in a lovely wide spacious baggy hide no it will pick the smallest cave it can it will raise it off the ground and it will shoehorn itself into the tightest space possible because that's where it feels comfy that's how it feels secure it's chose to be in there you don't get to decide that it doesn't want that hide that's the hide it picked you know and I think that when it comes to the brumation, it's very difficult to, if we get to the point where we are saying to people, you must, you must, you must. No, you need to be able to square this with yourself ethically. Can you make an ethical argument for not brumating your animal? Can you maintain its weight and make sure that it doesn't become obese and be sensitive to weight gain in your animal without the use of brumation? Now, the brumation invariably is used as a tool to both allow keepers to rest animals that potentially have stored fats, but also to rest animals that just don't want to feed anyway. So if you've got an animal that continues to feed and shows no slowdown, is it even is it a mute point? Well that's that's down to you. That's what you have to square with your ethical compass. You know, are you creating obese animals? You know, potentially a female if she's bred, she needs to run slightly heavy to produce the young. But then is she producing every year? Is that just an excuse for us to have a fat female? So it's it's these things that we need to look at. I thought I think it was an excellent question. I've probably actually not gone as far into it as I would have liked to. But there's so many things and it can't just be about the brumation. It raises loads of other questions. You remove what we perceive as the negatives from the wild. And captivity presents another set of negatives. Whether that be over availability of food. <coughs> incorrect temperature gradients, incorrect humidity, in, incorrect UV indices, incorrect positioning within the home. And it's all of these things that we're trying to juggle and balance and keep right. Certain element, animals are more tolerant than others. That's what makes them a novice or beginner level animal. The other ones that throw in more balls and your hands are going at double pace because you're trying to balance all this other stuff for your equatorial pythons or your arboreal boa constrictors from South America and all this and you're just like oh my god I haven't got enough hands and they won't move quick enough and I can't balance it all that's what makes an advanced snake and it's that juggling skill that you develop over time you don't come out just a fully fledged clan you've got to you've got to learn so I hope that was useful I, j I thought it was a really interesting question thank you ever so much Jackal26 we like these sort of theory or what if questions there isn't necessarily some you know round answer to go in a circular hole you know we might have got a star shaped hole in a square peg and think mm. and we have to work out how to get it to fit and it doesn't always fit and it's great really interesting and these these sorts of questions are what is really making this series uh, snakes and adders reptile advice slightly different to everything else <coughs> normally we'll stand and we're telling you stuff we want the back and forth we want you to join in we want your comments wherever this is shared whether it's youtube facebook reptile report wherever um you know join in have a conversation what do you think how do you square things ethically do you brumate your animals do you not brumate your animals what's your rationale for not doing so as much as doing so because obviously to just say because i want to nah isn't really a reason um, we have to think about these things cerebrally, we need to talk about them, and it's great, and uh, being given the opportunity to do so, I really, really enjoy. So, uh, from me and Paul at Snakes and Adders, peace.